Hello Science Made Simple fans and Jim Al Khalili fans. You join us here in lovely Regent's Park with our patron, Professor Jim Al Khalili. So Jim, we just met at Broadcasting House. Can you tell me what you were doing there? What you're up to generally at the moment? Yes, well Broadcasting House is, is the BBC's headquarters and I present the Life Scientific on Radio 4 on Tuesday mornings. Uh, and so I was there today to record the next episode in the in the new run, the new series, which starts in a couple of weeks. Time. Brilliant! So that's coming out end of August. Is end of right? August, yes, end of August. Excellent. Well, I'm sure people will be listening out for that. I and hope what so. else have you got coming up in the pipeline? Well, I'm I'm doing radio and television at the moment. Mm -hmm. So I've just finished um, the bulk of filming for a new BBC Four two-parter mm -hmm. called Light and Dark that's television. Oh, right. Uh, and it's a series about the, the, the nature of light and how we've used light to, to learn about the universe. So it's a nice mixture of the history, Galileo's telescope, Hooke's microscope, but also uh, how we learn about what we see, what we can't see in the universe. So that's the dark. Dark stuff, that's <laughs> the dark, the dark matter, dark energy. Um, and that's been tremendous fun. We're almost at the end of filming. Brilliant. Uh, so that'll be out later this year. That sounds great. Anything else going on? Well, other than that, it's, it's the, the day job, as, as I call it, the, the, doing the proper physics. I yeah. mean, I'm still a professor of physics at Surrey University. I, I run the admissions in the physics department. Um, I have um, PhD students doing research, and I'm in the middle of writing a book on quantum biology. That's my new big thing now. So, well, that brings me on to thinking about, actually, what, what got you interested in physics in the first place? Well, I, I got hooked by physics when I was about 13 or so, I think. I don't think I was particularly, I mean, I was good at maths and I, and I liked most subjects, but I think by the age of 12, 13, I was much more interested in football mm -hmm. and pop music and all the, you know, the normal things. Yeah. Uh, but for some reason, I, I think it was probably an inspirational teacher, as is often the case. Yeah. Uh, that got me really keen on physics and from the age of 13 that was it, I wanted to do physics and, and uh, I've sort of never looked back. So was there something that made you want to go that extra step and do the PhD or some crucial moment in your research career that you think has really stood out for you? Well for my, in my final year of my undergraduate studies I did a, a research project, a final year project mm -hmm. Uh, in theoretical physics, quantum mechanics, mm -hmm. uh, and I worked with a professor at the University of Surrey, where I still am now, so I just haven't really escaped from the place. And I got a good mark for it, but I got the wrong answer. Uh, and he, he, he said, uh, you did very well, would you like to come back over the summer and spend a few weeks redoing your calculation to get the right answer? And I remember thinking, well, if you knew what the right answer was, why the hell were you getting me to do it? And not knowing that's what, you know, students do they, they're yeah. trained into, to do research but I so enjoyed it that, and he clearly saw that I've got the bug and he said well, how about staying on a bit longer and doing a PhD and, and I knew uh, immediately that that's what I that's what I wanted to do and I was due to get married after graduation so I thought I couldn't take on the PhD I thought no I've, you know, I've got to get a job mortgage and you know, be, be, be sensible and grown up but my wife supported me, she said, well, if you want to do a PhD, you know, I'll support you, pay me back when you can. <laughs> I'm still paying her back. Uh, but that was it, you know, doing a PhD meant that was it. I got the bug for research and I, I never looked back. Excellent. Well, you have now, you now hold a chair in public engagement since 2006, is yes. that right? Can you just describe a little bit about what your role entails? As you... Yes, well, I, I, when I started as a, as a lecturer, uh, you know, a lecturer in, in, in any subject at university has tends to have three traditional jobs. You teach, you do research, and you do admin, which is what you have to do. You most most uh, academics try to do as little admin as possible. Um, and those were the three roles. But I was also interested in um, outreach and science communication. And I started off going, giving talks to school kids, writing the odd magazine or newspaper article. I became the person in my physics department that journalists would come to. Well, they'd be pointed in my direction because I was the friendly physicist and I, I could explain things in a simple way. And, and that was just something that gradually built up. And I started in science communication at a time when it wasn't really deemed a respectable thing to do. 
So I was doing it sort of almost sort of moonlighting, you know, on the sly, on the sly <laughs> when I'd done my proper teaching and research and so on. Uh, but it built up to such an extent that the university began to see the benefits that they could have they could get from me being an ambassador for the university and so this chair in public engagement was something quite new at the time. When it began it was quite difficult to, to find that balance, the tension between the two, making sure I could still do my teaching and do my research, still publish my research but also go off and do the writing and broadcasting um, and now that that media fellowship was finished the university have continued to support me so some fraction of my salary is paid centrally by the university rather than by the department. So the university is buying out some of my time from the department. So it all works very, very nicely. Fantastic. Well, I said you were a man of many hats. One of them is on the advisory committee for Cheltenham Science Festival. Is yes, that right? yes. Um, can you give, tell me some of your highlights of the Cheltenham Science Festival? The Cheltenham Science... I mean, there are many uh, science festivals around the country now, uh, and it seems almost every city has its own mm -hmm. science festival. Uh, the Cheltenham Science Festival is probably the best, the highest profile. It's the one that attracts the big name speakers from science. And I just love it. I mean, I wasn't involved the first year around. It's now 13 years, yeah. I think. Uh, so I, from the second year onwards, I've been at every one. And I always seem to think when I go into the, the Cheltenham Science Festival's green room where all the speakers are, it's like coming home. Because there's all the other science communicators who are like me. Who, who do science but also communicate. And there's something about the Cheltenham Festival that, that you, you step into the, the town hall at Cheltenham and you're like, you're in a bubble where you're a real celebrity. <laughs> I, you know, I, you walk in and suddenly there are people queuing up wanting to take photos and want my autograph. You step outside at the end of it and you're back sort of to relative anonymity, which is quite nice. You know, we're not all Brian Cox. Okay. Um, you know, who's a, who's you're a close. super. Well, no, Brian, Brian's a superstar wherever he is. I, I'm quite happy to be, you know, that sort of celebrity at places like Cheltenham Science Festival, but outside it, I can lead a normal life. And in all of these things that you've done, whether it's radio or TV or involvement with Cheltenham Science Festival, is there anything where it's been a different field from your research that you've encountered where you've really been amazed and astounded by some, something which you're not? involved with directly yourself Ab absolutely well i mean think what that happens now all the time with my radio program life mm -hmm. scientific because i'm interviewing all sorts of scientists from all um, areas of science it's very broad you know from psychology to computer science and you know i have to do the the research i have to learn not only about the, the guest but about their work and get the science right. It's, you know, it's one of the things you miss if you are an academic focus in a particular narrow field, you tend not to appreciate just how much else is going on in science. Sort of breadth and just how breadth, and just how you know this uh, there's a very, very interesting world out there. And if you're stuck in for instance in my area of theoretical nuclear physics, you don't quite appreciate just how complex and fascinating biochemistry is or psychology. Um, so it's in, it infuses and, and, and inspires me in my own science. Yeah. And so you said about interviewing different people from a, a wide range of different scientific backgrounds. Is there anyone, living or dead, who you would really love to interview? Oh, well, if, if, if we expand it to living or dead, then it would have to be people, someone like Richard Feynman, I think I would have. And in fact, any of the pioneers of quantum mechanics, Niels Bohr, Werner Heisenberg, some of the, Paul Dirac, I mean, some of these guys may be rather difficult to interview because I can't imagine someone like Paul Dirac or Niels Bohr being able to explain things at a level that's, that's sort of understandable by the general public. Feynman but would be okay. Feynman would, be, would have no <laughs> problems there. So yeah, I mean, um, I have so many heroes in physics that I would love to uh, been able to interview. In terms of those living, well, I think a lot of my, my heroes and the people that I want to interview, I, I, I've been getting as guests. That's fantastic. <laughs> Lucky to be yeah, able no, to No, absolutely. absolutely. Um, uh, well, at Science Made Simple, we absolutely love demonstrating science. One of the things we pride ourselves on is some of our demos in our shows. Is there a really great demonstration that you really love? Something that really makes some science clear? For me, I guess the, the most fascinating demonstrations are those that are closer to my more difficult area of mm -hmm. physics, quantum mechanics. Yes. Uh, and so there's something called the two-slit experiment, 
where you fire atoms at a screen with two narrow slits and they behave like waves, like water going in, in a ripple tank um, uh, and, and the interference of waves. And it's one of those experiments that no one understands what's going on. It doesn't matter. So people say, oh, how can that be? You just have to say, well, don't know. That's just how atom, that's what atoms do. You know? So if people appreciate that you know, it's okay to be confused by quantum mechanics, then they maybe not be so scared of it. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> um, well, that brings me on to, you are patron of Science Made Simple. We're very pleased to have you I'm as very our honoured. <laughs> Good. Um, and why did you accept? Well, I mean, I, I, I've known Wendy Sadler for many years. And, and you know we've, we've both done sort of we've started off roughly at the same time doing science communication I worked with her uh, together in helping the British Council and, and they were looking for, for new projects in, in, in science uh, and so so Wendy and I were called up as two sort of science communicators to talk about what to, you know, to propose some projects for them propose things like fame lab which has now been exported around the world um, and so I was aware of some of the science-based simple demonstrations at the Cheltenham Science Festival and you know the, uh, the stuff that's done on stage in the big main you know, I, I sometimes wonder and look at the, look at the you know the kids faces and just you know how, how uh, engaged they are in it that you know there aren't that many um, programs and projects that really target younger audiences uh, you know there's a lot of science communication that's aim for adults uh, uh, and, and I for instance you know I think most of my, my outreach stuff tends to be for, for uh, uh, an older audience but for something like Science Made Simple which spans the whole age range I think is is very important I'm surprised there aren't that many other projects like Science Made Simple that, that are popping up well maybe there are but there, I mean, are, there are a few but we are probably We've so been around for you've a been while. around, and therefore the the best known, the highest profile, and so uh, yeah, I, I thought it would be a very nice well, honour honor to be involved. We're very pleased to have you, indeed. Now, I've got a couple, a few final questions um, from some of our followers. So one is from Tom, and he says, um, "Which physicist do you think has had the greatest impact on your career and or research?" Well, um, I suspect. It would be my PhD supervisor, Ron Johnson, because he was the person who convinced me to do a PhD. He and I now both supervise students together. So I still, he's in his mid 70s, he's still active, I still work with him. I'm still in awe of, of his brains and his memory. Um, and, and he's the world expert on the deuteron, which is the nucleus of a deuterium atom, a proton and neutron stuck together. And I remember when starting my PhD, people told me, there's nothing Ron Johnson doesn't know about the deuteron. In fact, his nickname is Deuteron Johnson. <laughs> uh, and, and yeah, I mean, he's, he, he's so smart. Uh, I, I mean, he's really sort of inspired me to keep going in, in, in science and research. That's fantastic. And now, finally, a slightly irreverent question from Adam Kirk. Oh, Kirk, come on. I agree yeah. with you. Yeah, I mean, I mean Picard's fine. But, um, you know, it's, it's a, I remember I, 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 for many years I've taught a course on relativity uh, theory to first year undergraduates. Uh, and halfway through the course, there's a lecture where I um, prove that nothing can go faster than light. And for the example, I use uh, a story from Star Trek of the. Um, uh, the Federation who do have a, have a treaty with the Klingons not to build a faster than light missile and it's you, then you go through the maths showing that if something goes faster than light in one frame of reference that means it's travelling backwards in time and that leads to paradoxes. Basically, you mathematically prove nothing can go faster than light. But I always start the lecture every year by saying are there any Trekkies in the audience and this is a physics undergraduate so you know, half, be so. Uh, <laughs> half or more than half the hands go up but there's a few groans. Uh, and um, I remember talking, telling them about Star Trek, and I said, "This is from the original Star Trek." And they said, "Oh, you mean the really old Star Trek, John Luke Picard?" And I said, "No, <laughs> the original Star." Trek. And uh, you realise that you know you, you've reached a certain age when they think the oldest Star Trek they can go back to is is the new generation Star Trek. And <laughs> of course, no, Kirk and Spock are, are my main men. I tend to agree with you. Well, Jim, thank you very much indeed. My pleasure. Thanks.